Um, thanks again for, for having me here. And for those of you that stuck into the end of the day on the last day, good for you and didn't find the way down at the big screen where the Blue Jays are playing in their first playoff game in 22 years. If you are checking your device or watching the game while I'm doing it, all I ask is that you just pay half attention to me and when we actually score a run, let me know, okay? All right, good stuff. Um, I do want to just, uh, I'm going to talk about um, Lori Stevens quite a bit and SmileCon. Um, you've already heard Lori talk about, I signed on to my first Twitter account, Facebook account, and LinkedIn account in April 2010. Um, it was after I had asked the chief of the day, Chief William Blair, and the command team that I had just joined about uh, approving me to start a social media strategy for the Toronto Police Service. And the initial response was actually laughter. They didn't believe that any police service, certainly not the Toronto Police Service, should be in social media. That was something that pimply faced kids did in their parents' bed, um, basements. And so I needed to convince them and a whole lot of other people who were actually against the idea that this was something that was worthwhile. Uh, and I'll give you a bit of a longer explanation later on. Um, but quite frankly, the key breaking point was coming to the small conference in Washington, DC with a group of very cynical, in fact, negative people. And they were being convinced by not just Lori, but the group of practitioners like yourself who were around the tables, who were trying to find their way and who had experienced some positive results and were willing to share them. And it was that conference that allowed me to come back to the Toronto Police Service and for us to become one of the best agencies, I think, in the world in terms of what we're trying to do with social, cyber, and digital. I say all that with this caveat. This is not a presentation about technology. It's not even that much of a presentation about social media or cyber security or digital platforms. It's a presentation about policing and the future of policing, which I believe is going to very much hinge on the ability of police organizations and police individuals to stay in the game of the ever-changing world of social, cyber, and digital. I want to give a big shout out to Kerry Blakeman. Um, I have been following and engaging with Kerry online uh, over the last several years. He is a very worthy recipient of the Top Cop Award. He's taken away my mantle from last year, so I'm a little bit jealous, but if it was going to go to anybody else, Kerry, I'm glad it's going to you, my friend. We shared a couple of uh, beers in Toronto, just up the street from my home, in a very poor imitation of an Irish pub with his lovely wife, and uh, found out a lot more about the human being. The man in, in person is even more impressive than, than the police uh, professional on Twitter. And a, a great credit to a great uh, police agency in West Midlands, and an amazing policing tradition in the UK. And again, I'll touch a little bit more on Kerry's impact and the British impact on what we're doing. Of course, we all know the impact is this whole British invasion thing that they've been doing back into the uh, colonial days and through the 60s of the Beatles. It's just carrying on as we go. Um, I'm going to whip through these slides because I'm sure you guys, I'm preaching to the, uh, the, the choir on this one. You guys know about change, you know how important change is. You understand that change is no longer happening in this sort of evolutionary pace, that it's actually at this point in the 20th, 21st century in the knowledge economy, in the technical age, change has gone to a vertical rate. It's exponential. It doesn't happen every couple of years. It happens literally in the digital age, almost every couple of hours, where there's a new product, a new application, a new application of the application into almost every aspect of our lives. And so the ability for law enforcement professionals, police leaders to sort of scan the horizon and take their time assessing threats and opportunities, devising strategic plans, figuring out who's going to run the pilot project, evaluating the pilot project after some 18 months, and then taking the next two to three years to mainstream that technology into day-to-day -day operations. It just simply doesn't exist as a business model anymore when you have a rate of change as large as this is. This is a picture of my daughter in the womb about nine years ago. She was holding a Blackberry. Uh, my son was just born about 14 months ago. He was holding a Samsung product. I don't know how this stuff is getting into the birth canal, but whatever is happening, this is the new age of, of our children. They come right out and their chubby little fingers get a hold of the stuff that we're holding on to, which in my household is one of these. And off they go. They learn how to manipulate screens. They learn how to make things happen. And the device becomes part of their natural environment. These are the millennials. I had the pleasure of 10 years ago devising a new recruiting and hiring strategy for the Toronto Police Service. At that point, the money was flowing and we were supposed to hire in excess of 2,000 officers over the next five years. 2,000 officers, about 90% of them were millennials. These millennials came on the job as digital natives. They understood this stuff. They had the devices in their hands. They understood the software. They were into actually creating the applications. They arrive into a police service that at this point thinks that social media doesn't exist. And who, who does know about it? Well, they're not interested in it being part of the police service. These folks are the largest cohort in history, bigger than the baby boomers. 
They have at their fingertips all of the knowledge of human history. By their size and by their access to knowledge, they will dwarf anything that the baby boomer population has ever done in our entire lifetimes. And they now represent over 75% of the police officers driving police cars in the Toronto Police Service, the fourth largest municipal police service in North America and the largest in Canada. And so they're having a major impact on the way we're doing policing on the front lines right now. Digital Darwinism is sort of like survival of the fittest. In this world of exponential change that is being driven by technology and specifically by digital cyber social media, if you can't keep up with it, you will become extinct. Your career will not advance within your police agency. Your police agency will not advance its cause of serving and protecting a population that is increasingly digitized in every aspect of their life. We'll make ourselves extinct if we don't invest in this, in this reality. Uh, this is a little bit of a timeline graph. I apologize, it's really small. Um, but it kind of breaks out human history going back into about a billion years ago. Uh, well, world history going back a billion years ago. Human history as it relates to the last 30,000 years. And then more specifically, the role of communication and storytelling, which has been one of the most important advances in human history. In fact, the cognitive re revolution that was described around 10,000 BC is what separated Homo sapiens from the apes. And the whole idea of the cognitive revolution was simply the ability of our earliest ancestors to tell stories, to imagine a world that didn't yet exist. And in doing so, create myths and legends, religions that were able to be shared across the communities and provide a greater level of civilization that we've benefited from. This is just the last 50 years, the rate of technological innovation. You can see a relatively dense amount of tech, uh, tech work being done back about two decades ago, and the massive amount being done just in the last two years. Again, another way of demonstrating the rate of change that's affecting us. Every one of these applications has a security application, either for good and more likely because of the early adopter issue that Mubin just talked about for evil. This is the nature of change again. The rate of tech change is massive. It's a steep, almost vertical slope. When you look at the other areas, you see how flat those lines are. If I was to draw a fourth line in that represented the rate of change in policing as an institution in Western society, it would almost be a flat line. Bit of a challenge there to make up the delta. We've got the pressure of time against us now, and we're not winning this game. Rate of change is almost vertical. Our rate of change is almost horizontal. We are living and working in a very conservative organization. Our organizational culture generally resists change. We don't like to take leaps of faith in the policing world. And yet that's exactly what the current world is demanding of us, that we take a leap of faith. But five years ago, if the chief and the command of the day had said, you know what, we need to get into this. I don't know if, it, if the risk reward benefit is actually where we want it to be, but we can't deny the existence of this new disruptive technology what's going on so let's get into it as best we can we'll make some mistakes along the way but peter and whoever else you can put around go go make it happen go figure it out every one of your organizations are going to be confronted with the same issue myspace uh, this is one of the earliest digital platforms social media platforms again the first and early adopters bloods and crips working out of la at first trading insults and shooting each other as a result of that later on trading information about supply and demand ch uh, channels, negotiating and brokering peace agreements, discussing the tactics of police and law enforcement long before there was a police agency anywhere in North America that was looking into MySpace, never mind actively engaging that space. This is a timeline of every single mass shooting in the United States going back to Columbia up to Aurora, Colorado. Sorry, Columbine, up to Aurora, Colorado. It doesn't include the more recent ones, including the most recent one in Oregon, involving the mass killing there. In every single one of these instances, there was social, cyber, and digital evidence before, during, and after the incidents. Remember the Klebolds in Columbine? They were practicing their Warcraft on a digital platform. They were gaming. They were practicing how to acquire a target with a firearm, squeeze off a number of rounds, hit the target, and move on and acquire the next target. When military-level analysts looked at the Columbine shootings, they found that the Klebold brothers were able to have a target acquisition and hit ratio greater than Navy SEALs in actual combat. It's because they practiced it. And you heard to advance the cause of people committing mass atrocities around the world. Aurora, Colorado, somebody influenced by mass media, the opening of a Batman screening, has their own social media accounts, 
radio, basically broadcasting their intents to the local police and then going out and carrying out the act and after the fact there was digital evidence all, all over the place. This is the police chief in poor Newtown, Connecticut, where over 30 young school age kills were slaughtered in a small school, the vast majority of which were crowded into a bathroom by being protected by their teacher. Gentleman walks in with a high capacity magazine, squeezes a trigger and blows away about a whole classroom of kids in about three seconds. He was influenced by online postings of other mass murders from around the world. His intent was to create, there was a slide that Mubin had up, it's not how many you kill, it's how many people that are watching. He wanted to become the greatest mass murderer, so he needed a body count, but he also needed an audience. Again, digital evidence available before the fact, during the actual incident, and after the fact. I can guarantee you that this sheriff did not have a PIO, did not have a social cyber digital expert sitting anywhere near them. He's doing a stand-up right now for CNN and the national media around the world. What was happening at the same time was that the NRA and sympathetic pro-gun users were attacking him the parents of the dead children and that community for faking the slaughter in order to create firearm legislation in the United States. So he's dealing with the worst operational nightmare of his career. He's dealing with the most, the worst public relations nightmare of his career. And now he's got a social cyber digital nightmare that he's completely unprepared for. We do not want to put our police chiefs in that situation, but they are right now at risk of it. You got flash mobs and bully sides. You've got victimization rates in Canada for cybercrime that are far, probably by far, the most underreported crime that's going on anywhere in the country right now. And I'll talk about the definition of cybercrime later on or the lack thereof. You've got groups like Anonymous, which are not terrorists, they're not criminal, but they can be terrorists and they can be criminal. They don't have a membership and they don't have a manifesto. They simply gather when they want, how they want, where they want, and do basically what they want because they have the collective intelligence of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who are far more technically experienced and far more goal motivated than anybody in this room. They have threatened nation states with cyber attacks. They have exposed the personal information of police chiefs and, and police leaders in very contentious public order issues, most recently in Ferguson, Missouri, where the police chief and his entire family were outed as a result of Anonymous's claim that he was not doing his proper job as a police leader. They've investigated incidents in Canada where the police of jurisdiction were, were unable and in fact unwilling to go into an internet related investigation that caused the death of a young person. And they exposed the inability of the local police department to generate the evidence. And it was their work that actually got a prosecution before the courts and ultimately a conviction. This is the Boston Marathon. Commissioner Davis, who was then the commissioner of Boston, instructed his police commanders, people at my level and below, that they had to have not only a Twitter account, but they had to be active on the account and had to actually put out a tweet from the beat at every single day. At the start of the race, the local commander put out this tweet at the finish line. It's a beautiful sunny day, hoping it will be a safe and, and successful event. And a couple hours later, we know the images that were coming in that, from that uh, event. Again, an event that was probably very much possible, actually not possible, very much a case where they had digital evidence available before in terms of the activities of the two terrorists and huge amounts of data during and a huge amount of issues right after the fact. What was interesting for me was that this became a global event. Uh, the, rec the coverage of this thing was 24 seven over the course of almost a full week. The single source of truth for accurate information was not CNN, was not Fox, it was not BBC. It was a Twitter account for the Boston Police Department. And where mainstream news agencies and very respected news personalities like Wolf Blitzer were claiming that the incident was over and it was actually ongoing the Boston Twitter feed was the one that was actually the record. In California history, this was not a Bloods or Crips member. This was not a member of the Hells Angels. This was a member of the LAPD who had a bit of PTSD from his couple of tours in the Far East, access to again, huge amounts of firearms, had a disagreement with his, with his, within his organization and decided to target as victims of homicides, not only the members of LAPD, but their family members as well. He was hunted around the state for a number of days until somebody checked that he had a Facebook account. And when they went in there, they found his list of grievances, his manifesto, a list of most of his weapons, and through geocoded information, a list of all the places he was likely to be. After they found his Facebook account, they were able to narrow him down, corner him, he ultimately took his life. If they just checked his Facebook account to begin with. Again, to the point made earlier, it's not how many you kill, it's how many people are watching. This was a terrorist event. It was an attack on a single off-duty British soldier in London. 
The goal, though, was not to kill a soldier. Obviously, that was not going to defeat the British Army and their activities in Iraq and the, and the Far East. The goal was to kill somebody in a very public way, and in doing so, create an immediate viral response on social media. People understand how human nature works. When you see a bloody scene, what do you see around the bloody scene? People stopping and taking out their mobile device and taking pictures, uploading it instantly. They knew that while they were still actually killing this soldier, there'd be people there with their devices out. And as the partner was continuing the, 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 the stabbing of the, the soldier, this gentleman walked over, hands still bleeding, to an individual and said, film me. And they dutifully filmed them. And they were able to get out their manifesto, their message, to a worldwide audience, and it went viral before the British police could even start an investigation and begin to mitigate against the risk. And we've heard enough about this topic here today. I will tell you that ISIS has within their employ people who are engineers at the class of MIT, script writers who could probably write books that would fetch them millions of dollars, production people, image consultants, whatever you want in order to create a narrative that makes us look like a bunch of amateurs. I was at a meeting at the IACP two years ago, LAPD was at the table, MI5, MI6, a whole group of people involved in this issue. And every one of them said, we can't compete. We can't compete on the digital platform. We can't compete on the counter narrative. LAPD said that they'd actually hired a Hollywood producer in order to create a narrative that they could use for their local population just to get into the game. For me, the definition of cybercrime from a, an assault to a theft to an abduction to a robbery to a homicide, every crime, I will guarantee you, has some digital footprint before, during, or after. So I don't really think in differentiating, you know, it's, this is hacking and this is fraud and this is, no, it's every single crime in the modern age in a country like Canada will have some cyber related element. And so you don't need a cyber crime unit. You need an entire police service that has some level of cyber capacity. From your recruiting, to your training, to your deployment, to your courses that you offer, every single course should have some element of a cyber component within that course design. Every evaluation that you have of any one of your personnel, are they a Luddite or are they capable of accessing the internet, surfing it, generating information, and putting information out and sharing it in some sort of digital platform? Skills principles, again, thanks to our colleagues from the UK. Um, I actually don't believe we've ever implemented Peel's principles. It's something we've aspired to over the course of the last century and a half. People say going back to Peel's principles, we never ever got there in the first place. But I still think they're as relevant today as they were 100 plus years ago. They're relevant here in, the, in Ontario. And for those of you, I know we have folks from Panama, welcome to Canada. I hope you've enjoyed the conference and found it as useful as we have. And of course, our brothers and sisters from south of the border. And for those of you from outside of Ontario, but pretty well every single Provincial Police Service Act is the same. It requires you to do two things philosophically and practically. It requires you first and foremost to deliver community policing in the way that Peel's principles articulate. The police are the, are the people and the people are the police. And we do that with the consent of the people in cooperation with the people. Real simple. The second part is you do it as a police service that is reflective of and sensitive to the population in which you serve and protect. And that's not by making sure you have enough brown-skinned people and black-skinned people and white people and LGBTQ people. Those are all important, and there's a business case for that. But it's to be able to understand the nature of the people and the context in which they live. In Toronto, in the GTA, the greater Toronto area, we are the largest consumers of social media in North America and one of the largest in the world. We produce as many applications or more than any other place in North America and one of the most in the world. So if I, as a police officer for 27 years in Toronto, am not sensitive to the fact that the vast majority of Torontonians are quite expert in the area of social, cyber, and digital, and I cannot provide a service that meets that expectation, I'm not doing my job according to a lawfully mandated requirement of the Police Services Act. This isn't an option that you have to do community policing, and it's not an option that you have to do cyber, social, and digital policing. It's an actual legal requirement. Failure to do so, in, quite, in my opinion, is negligence as a police officer and negligence as a police service. There's also some core mandated tactical things that we're supposed to do every single day. And the list is written in a very particular order. I'll give you time to look, have a quick look at that. The first one listed up there is called crime prevention. Now, I've had the pleasure over 27 years to go across most of the Western world 
a little bit of a couple of other continents as well, in search of the police agency that invests fully in the most important aspect of police service delivery, crime prevention. The highest I've ever been able to find in terms of scarce resources, people, money, and time, is three to 5%. And I'm being a bit kind. Sometimes it's in the 1% range. Three to 5% of almost every Western police agency is what's invested in crime prevention. And I would ask every one of you to think about your personal lives. How much time do you invest into your personal life, your children, your family, your house, your neighborhood, your school, where your children go to, in preventing bad things from happening? By insurance, we make sure that our basements don't flood out in heavy rains, we street-proof our children, we eat well, we go to the doctor once a, once a year to get a checkup, and yet somehow when we come into work and we put on a uniform and strap on a gun and display a badge, we somehow think that prevention is the last and least most important thing to do. Oh, we'll leave it to that guy over there. He's in charge of prevention for the Toronto Police Service. Where is the disconnect that happens when we put on our uniform and come into work? People don't want to be the victim of a crime and have a perfect response. They don't want to be the victim of a crime in the first place. Order maintenance. If you don't have a relationship with the people in your community, disorder will happen. If you don't have a relationship before the disorder, you can't expect to get the, the relationship going in the middle of the disorder. And so you need to have a relationship with every member of your community all the time, especially in the good times before the bad times come. And so that means that you don't leave it to the other guy or gal to be your community relations officer. Everybody should be into crime prevention and everybody should be into community relations. Otherwise, you can't fulfill your mandate. You become a very expensive, quite frankly, service, an unsustainably expensive service, because the really expensive stuff starts right after crime prevention. This is Toronto, 140 neighborhoods that make up a city of 2.6 million people. They're all unique little neighborhoods with their own unique histories, unique characteristics, unique civilians that live there, leaders, criminals, priests, imams. The cops that work in those neighborhoods have a different approach in, in many cases because they understand the environment that they're in. I'm pretty sure it's the same as London or West Midlands or Niagara or London, Ontario. Your number one customers, who are your top customers in the police departments that are represented here? The people that we actually spend the most time serving and protecting. The people that we actually have to provide the greatest amount of victim support. The people that are most likely to be victimized and repeatedly victimized over and over again. Economic crisis. When I first developed this slide, it was right after the economic crisis of 2008. In Canada, we're back into a recession again. This is the budget of the city of Toronto. You notice that uh, large green slice of pie down there? I think it's green. Oh, blue actually, sorry. That's the Toronto Police budget. 24.5% of, of every single dollar that I pay as a, as a taxpayer in the city of Toronto goes to paying my salary as a Toronto Police Service member. 25% of the municipal budget tied up in policing. For a billion dollar budget, which is what we are, every 1% represents two, $10 million. So a 1% increase of cost of living or a 1% increase in the collective bargaining, a new contract, is $10 million. On average, every year, Cost of living is two to three percent, and we just settled a contract that gave us two or two plus percent for the next three years. So conservatively, in one year, without a new initiative, without buying a new police car, without hiring a new police officer, we increased the tax impact by conservatively 40 million, more closely 60 million dollars. And in fact, because the city of Toronto wants a one percent reduction from the Toronto Police next year, one percent on top of the four percent, that's five percent, that's 50 million dollars. We're not going to be able to find 50 million dollars. What do we do? We're not sustainable. I was just talking to Kerry Blakeman, and he says that the ongoing uh, cuts to the policing budget in the UK, they just went through around five years, 15%, I forget the numbers, Kerry, and now you're into a new round of another ridiculous amount of percentage cuts. For us to get $50 million, we need to lose 50 police officers, just to start off the conversation. Now, there's some police departments in here that if they lost 50 police officers, they wouldn't exist anymore. I can tell you, even in Toronto with, with 5,000 plus police officers, I would feel 50 going out the door. Then, well, okay, we're going to lose cops. So you know what we're going to do? We're not going to do that crime prevention stuff anymore. 
We're not gonna do that community relations stuff anymore, right? Because that's not real policing. Enforcement is what real policing is. Rapid response to 911 calls, that's real policing. But you know what, the people that you serve and protect, they want that prevention because they don't want you rapidly responding to their house at all. And they want that community relationship because they want to trust you. When the lights are off, they want to trust you. Unfortunately, right now, there's not a whole lot of trust between you, us, and them. It's getting worse. The trend lines around trust and legitimacy in Western policing has been going down for 10 straight years. Over the same time, the crime has been going down. Issues like racial profiling and carding, relationships with your First Nations people, wherever you happen to come from. Islamophobia, post 911, post ISIS. And if I could spread the list out, your lesbian gay community, your disabled community, your mental health community, anybody who's not part of the mainstream, is feeling a little bit out of things. In the North American context, Trayvon Martin, Ferguson, Mr. Garner from NYPD, the Sammy Yatim shooting, out of interest, um, I ran our frontline command for the last four years. I was just transferred recently. But I was the deputy chief in, in charge of our frontline officers. I got the phone call for the Sammy Yatim shooting at about 12.30 at night. I normally go right into, uh, into my, my, my laptop and get onto my Twitter feed and look to see if pictures are already being uploaded. Pretty well in Toronto, if anything happens, when we shoot somebody or somebody shoots us, you're gonna have content on a digital platform that I should be able to look at even before I get to the scene. Within minutes of turning on my computer, I was able to see 24 different videos that had already been uploaded that had pretty graphic evidence that this was going to be a significant issue for the Toronto Police Service to deal with. By the time I got down to 14 Division, which is only a 12 and a half minute drive from my home, and I had the inspector of the division and the SIU liaison in an office, I got briefed by them and they said, look, this looks like a pretty good shoot. We look like we're gonna be okay on this thing. And I said, have you seen the video? And they said, what video? I said, the 24 videos that are online, have you seen the video? And so I used my little device and I showed them the video and all of a sudden everybody in the room realized that we had a big problem. And we're gonna be living with this issue for the next probably half decade. And we are. There's a criminal case right now before the courts involving the officer. So I can't comment much further than that. This is the new world order. Every one of your police officers and every one of my police officers, whenever they decide to go up and talk to somebody, I almost guarantee that that person has the ability, if not the actual functionality, oops, back on here one touch of a thumb or a finger they create a device that is able to record everything it's automatically uploaded so even if you want to smack this out of their hands it's already too late in fact it'll be just further more incriminating evidence that's the new world order assume that every single encounter that you initiate or somebody initiates with you is going to be recorded either directly by the person and uploaded immediately or recorded by multiple other persons or cctv cameras and uploaded it's a requirement then of every single police officer anywhere in the world to be just doing the right thing for the right reason every single second of every single day. There are no more dark places in policing. We are living with the issue of carding. I understand it's visited Hamilton, Niagara, Peel Region, Calgary, Edmonton. It's called things different north and south of the border. The UK have been dealing with this in their own way, stop and frisk, stop and search. This is at the core of community policing. If the police officer can't approach somebody in the community and have a conversation for investigative or other purposes, then what's the point of having a police service? It's also at the core of privacy and human rights. Because if the police officer goes up to somebody to have a conversation with them based on their own personal bias or based on any other agenda other than their lawful purpose and extends that beyond what the Charter of Rights or Human Rights requires, then it's illegal. And if racism or sexism or homophobia or anything else is involved in it, it's unethical and it's immoral as well. And for anyone in this room, it should be intolerable. For me, it's not a debate about whether we should be carding or not carding. We should only be doing legitimate, ethical, lawful policing. And anything else should not be done. This is an issue that won't go away in Toronto. It ain't gonna go away in Peel either. And it's coming to a town near you if it hasn't arrived already. It'll be called something different. But it is what it is. And layer that issue on top of social, cyber, and digital, and the volume of criticism coming our way I mean, our inability to create a counter-narrative around ISIS is pathetic. Our inability and unwillingness to create a, an effective counter-narrative around the issue of carding and racial profiling and bias and policing is equally pathetic 
and potentially more dangerous to the actual soul of modern policing. The Economist says that American police services are on trial. I would suggest it's the same here in Canada and the UK and most of the world. But how are we doing with that trial? For most of the last two decades, we hired more and more police officers in all of our jurisdictions. For most of the last decades, police officers did more and more of what they really like to do, enforcement. More provincial offenses, tickets for speeding, more parking tags, more people arrested, more people put into jails. Over two decades, crime went down, whether it was all because of good policing or because of other socioeconomic changes and demographic changes. I'll let the academics discuss that. But the fact is crime went down pretty good, right? And that was our KPI, crime reduction. We'd be sailing along. We'd be a billion dollar investment. Send your money our way. The problem is in the same time that fear of crime went up and trust in police went down. That's an inverse relationship. In fact, this study came out of the precursor study that created the neighborhood policing program in the UK. The UK academics that did this study called this inverse relationship the reassurance gap. People in our communities should be reassured that there are more cops in their community doing what cops do, enforcing the law, and their crime is going down, but they're not reassured because they're more afraid of crime and less trustful of the very police officers in their community. If you happen to be black or immigrant or Muslim, if you happen to be a woman or from the LGBT community, if you happen to be anybody that wasn't from mainstream, you actually were more fearful and less trustful. And that's called the optimism. Because that the police are actually serving and protecting you. Toronto was part of this study as well. Many of your agencies were involved in this study. Out of this, the UK created the Neighborhood Officer Program. They realized they had to not just drive crime down, but they had to build trust up. They had to win back the hearts of minds that were departing in rather large numbers year over year. Now what happens when there's less police, when the UK are reducing the number of police officers, where for us to make up a $50 million gap, we have to stop hiring for the next three years. And attrition at 200 per year, we're gonna be down lower than 5,000 officers in the next five years, unless we come up with a better strategy than what we have right now. And what happens when crime starts to go back up as it is in Toronto? Nine straight years of crime reduction, Last year we met zero, and this year it's spiking up. And what happens when on top of the crime increase, we have the underreported aspect of cybercrime? That's a tsunami of reported incidents that are gonna hit us pretty darn soon. This is an aerial photo of Jane and Finch, one of the highest crime areas in all of Canada, 31 division for those of you that follow the Toronto police piece. Um, it's a tough area. It's a tough place to do policing in. I was there in 1999 and 2000 as a second in command of the division. As many crises and controversies that took place then are happening now, and in fact, quite a few more. Great police station, though, full of great cops. There's an industrial area that provides local employment. There's a community center that provides some of Canada's best athletes, internationally known athletes from, from, from Canada. Local commerce and business that support the, the economy a hospital right in the heart of the community, one of Canada's largest universities, York University, ratepayers group that donate thousands of dollars every year to put local kids from poor uh, experiences into post-secondary education, cultural centers like the Jamaican Canadian Association, faith groups of every different faith and stripe that you can imagine, and a disproportionate number of young people, most of them racialized. That's a pretty good cocktail of any one of the 17 divisions in, in Toronto. They're all networked too. If you want to be an effective commander in 31 Division, you need to know the head of the Jamaican Canadian Association, the local imam, the guy that runs the after school homework program at York University, the business owner that will provide you the money to buy the t shirts for the sports group that you're going to be running. You need to know all these people. And guess what? They're not only networked on the street, they're networked in the virtual world. And so if you want to be a good police officer in 31 Division or 21, 22 Division, or any one of the divisions represented here in Niagara, you're gonna to have to be a really good cop in the real world and in the virtual world. Now, Lori uh, mentioned that I took part in the very first uh, SMILE conference. And this is a, a saying I stole from the chief of Boca Raton. Remember his name, Lori? I'm gonna test you here. Dan Alexander. Dan Alexander was one of the first presenters at the 2010 April SmileCon and he said this, and it just stuck with me. So I'm sure you've heard it in different forms. There's two things that cops hate, the way things are, and change. 
I guarantee you, no matter how much you love this conference, as much as I love my first conference, no, how much, no matter how much inspired you are, how many ideas you've written down, tweeted out, written on the back of a napkin, talked about over a beer after the day has ended, no matter how inspired you are when you drive back or fly back home, you're going to arrive back home to a place where people hate the way things are and they hate change. And I'm going to tell you, well, that was nice. That was a waste of three days and money. We're not implementing any of that crap here. That's the reality. That's what I've been facing for the majority of my 27 years in my organization. Good luck with it. But things aren't getting better. They're getting worse. And so at some point, we're going to stop living in denial and denying smart people and innovative people and actually get down to the business of providing progressive modern democratic policing. The other thing you can't do in order to be successful with social cyber and digital is you can't do it behind a desk. You can't do it even behind a device. If you can't get out of your office, out of your police station, out of your police car, off your police bike, go into the community, reach out with your hand, look somebody in the eye, press the flesh, start a conversation, no matter how difficult it is, build the beginnings of a relationship, agree to disagree on a whole bunch of things, say that we're going to come back tomorrow because we have to come back tomorrow, and the next day, and the next week, and the next month, and the next year. If you can't do that, then tweeting about it won't matter. And posting a really cool selfie on your Facebook site doesn't matter a hill of beans. You can't replace good neighborhood policing, good street cops, good relationships built over the course of time by Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. It just won't work. You know who taught me that? Scott Mills. Scotty Mills was the one that taught me that. And please remember this. Nothing that I'm saying here is that social media and cybersecurity and digital platforms is a panacea for everything. This is not going to get you promoted to sergeant. It is not going to reduce your $50 million budget. It's not going to make your mirror like you. It's not going to make your local community activists stand up and cheer for you. But it will give you a fighting chance in a world that is being consistently driven more and more by these technologies. It will give you a chance to survive and not become that Darwinism effect that we had talked about earlier on. Leadership is important on this. There's guys like me. I'm going to give myself a little pat on the back. I may not be around here for that very much longer. But I'll tell you, the only reason why I can stand up on this stage is not because of my personal brilliance. It's because of people like Scott Mills, who, when I was a staff superintendent overseeing the Crime Stoppers program, Scott would come into my office, usually without knocking, demand my attention, open up some bashed up old personal computer that he had and complain the fact that he had to use his own computer and not a company computer, and then demand that I understand that as much hard work that he was doing out on the alleyways with the graffiti kids and in the BMX parks where the kids were doing their tricks on their skateboards, that he had to maintain a relationship outside of the physical beat. And he had to go where the kids were going, which back then were cyber chat rooms. And then Facebook. And he told me about Facebook. And I said, well, what's that got to do with policing? I'm a big staff superintendent. I got big things to take care of. You're wasting my time, Scotty. And then he would show me, look, do you see this Facebook posting? This is a kid in my school area in 14 division. And he said he was going to kill himself. And he was going to bring a knife to school the next day. And I was able to contact the guidance counselor and the principal who I had a relationship with and convince him that I had good information that it was going to happen. We actually met the kid at the door and the knife was there. We got the knife off and we got him the help that he needed. We prevented the suicide. Crime prevention? much less costly. And then I had Ritesh Kotak. Ritesh is here, one of the smartest guys I know, pound for pound in, in policing anywhere in the world, understanding cyber, social, and digital. This is a guy who I pay really good money. I don't pay. Well, actually, I do. 25% of his salary comes from my tax dollar. He looks around corners for me. He looks around and sees what's coming up in terms of technology, opportunities, and risks. He comes into my office on a regular basis, also doesn't knock. And he talks about augmented reality and 3D printing and drones. And I, every time I go, what the hell has that got to do with policing? Can't you see I'm a very big, busy, important deputy chief? What does this mean? Sure as heck, six months later, he'd go, ah, they just printed a 3D gun that can fire a bullet. Holy. I don't know how it translates into Spanish, but uh, I'll let them do that. Lori McCann, you've all seen Lori today. We call her the coffee cop. Uh, she's one of those uh, ground troops from 14 Division like Scotty Mills that figured out that you've got to be able to talk to kids in their own language. 
Her passion is bullying, and particularly bullying in school and cyberbullying. She's one of the uh, noted experts for the Toronto Police, and I think you had a great lecture from her as well today. My point is here, it requires executive level leadership to crack through the resistance and cultural and structural barriers. If you don't have a godfather like me, it ain't going to happen. But a godfather like me needs to be informed and inspired by the frontline troops, the people that really know what's happening. And without the information and, quite frankly, inspiration of the people that I've just referenced, I wouldn't be here today, and I couldn't be speaking with the confidence. And I believe, I believe in what I'm telling you. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to denigrate our profession. I love our profession. I spent 27 years in it. But we're heading in the wrong direction. And there's going to be a course correction. It's going to hurt like hell. And it ain't just going to be in Toronto or the big cities. It's not just going to be in Canada. It's everywhere. One of the first things I need to give props to, and that's our other Lori. I can tell you without any hesitation, there are many great conferences and seminars that you go to, and I've been to some of them. There's nothing better than SmileCon. And I don't think there's been any other community partner that has helped the policing institution in North America, and because of their international contacts already, there's nobody that has advanced the thinking and the doing in the area of social, cyber, and digital than Lori Stevens and the Smile Conference. And everybody else amongst you who came up to a platform like this in Washington and Vancouver and in England and shared your experiences, your lessons learned, your personal passion that inspired so many others like me to go off and do something better. And so thank you very much, Lori. And can we just give her a round of applause? For I just you. So we put multiple officers in every one of our divisions across the city. Trained them on social media, social media strategy that was actually developed in partnership with Lori. She came up to Toronto for a very small amount of money, did an amazing job and put us on the map immediately with this program. We've, opened, we've now trained over 300 officers on uh, open source social media engagement. We have another thousand trained on uh, social media investigations. We're nowhere near where we need to be. These cops are connected within their police station physically, or they're also connected virtually. They share best practices over their own digital devices. They're connected across the city. A guy like Chris Body has got a way of doing things on Twitter. 299 other people can tap into, into Chris and say, hey, how do I increase my followership? How do I target my messages? And we share back information. It doesn't cost us a thing other than a few dollars for hardware and some data charges as well. More importantly for me though, those neighborhood cops that exist in every one of those 17 divisions, when they're out there on the street, reaching out their hand, pressing the flesh, looking in the eye, developing relationships, they've been issued their own devices, they've been trained on a three-day course, and they're able to tweet from the beat in the same way that the Boston Police Department was able to do. This is the 51 Division Region Park neighborhood officer team. This is their Twitter account. These are the images they put out on a daily basis. And every single day, a member of their team is on the ground in Region Park putting out these images of their interaction, their crime prevention efforts, their youth engagement efforts, their community relations efforts, their efforts to meet people in the places where they need to be met. Here's a Muslim officer at prayer in a local mosque on a Friday, demonstrating their willingness to bend down, kneel down in the most intimate encounter, and then go back out, put their gun on, and serve and protect that community. areas you want, seats on walls. You can insert as many undercover operatives as you think you could possibly get into a community. No one is going to be able to generate more intelligence information about a potential future terrorist attack or an individual that's being radicalized than a neighborhood cop that can get into a mosque and pray on a Friday afternoon. That's gold. And if it happens and nobody hears about it, other than me standing here in front of you 160 souls, well then how much of an impact does it have? But if it's tweeted out and it creates a permanent digital record, and if it's done so not just on one day on a special holy month, but every single Friday, then you've built a relationship ahead of the storm, created a relationship that you'll get a phone call before the crime or the radicalization even happens. I did this uh, little slide up. Actually, I didn't do it. Ritesh did it for me. He's way smarter than I am. But I did this up as a future of what things might look like. I did this for the police week about three years ago. 
I can tell you that right now what I'm about to show you is happening in every one of the 17 divisions in Toronto Police Service. It's probably happening to some degree in your jurisdictions, but let me just give a demonstration of what I mean by this. Time check. Okay, police car leaves 13 Division Station at Allen Road in Eglinton, drives down to Oakwood and Vaughan, high density crime area, guns and gangs and drugs, bloods and crips, the usual thing. Two neighborhood officers get out of the police car, check in on Foursquare, start walking the beat. I had to take a picture that I could find with two police officers with their hats actually on. It's a very rare thing. So the two officers start walking the beat, doing their thing, heads up, looking smart, athletic, fit, well-fed, well-rested, well-trained, well-selected, well-deployed, talking to people in the street. You can call it carding, you can call it racial profiling. I hope it's ethical, lawful, and effective at the end of the day. Walking along, all right, what are we gonna do now, partner? Well, it's time for us to head down to the library. You know, a year ago, this library had been taken over by the Bloods, and they had kicked all the kids out of there, destroyed all the after-school programming, and were actually selling drugs and violent crimes were happening in and around there. So we need to take back this library. So they created their own after-school uh, homework program. So they check in, tweet out, we're doing our after-school homework program here. Time to leave there, they head over to the local BIA, where they've created a hub multi-service agency. They bring cases of mental illness, homelessness, domestic abuse to the table. They've got public health, public education, local not-for-profits. The police bring about 80% of these cases. The not-for-profits take about 80% of those cases. We walk away with a much lower caseload who can actually prevent the issues and solve the issues, keep that caseload. We get an overall net result that we would never be able to do it unless we did it ourselves. So they tweet out at the BIA, engaging with the local hub. After that, they head over to the Fairbank Memorial Park, kick the soccer ball around, take a little picture, post it to Instagram, clear evidence that they were engaging with the youth. Next thing you know, they're up at uh, Eglinton and Dufferin investigating a series of pickpocket events that have taken place. They, talk, they, st they stop in and talk to a local store owner who gives them information about a pickpocket who just left. They track him down, they arrest him, they tweet out, they've made the arrest, hashtag safer neighborhoods. Heading over to the Tim Hortons coffee shop for a coffee and donut break is all coffee. They stay there, have a coffee, have a donut, chat with the local community. Time to head in for shift, back down to the police car, tweet out that they're heading back in, drive the car back up to the station. And before they head off duty, let people know that there'll be a community meeting at the station later on. Come to the station, enjoy some more coffee and donuts, but if you can't make it, we're gonna live stream it and you can watch on live stream. How easy is that to do? Three days of training, one team issued BlackBerry, the freedom from a deputy chief to go forth and do this, and the ability to contact hundreds of people in the course of their 10 hour shift, and tens of thousands of people who will check that digital stream for eternity after that. Every single day, 365 days a year. This is the neighborhood policing team up in 23 division. The uh, Somali community right across Canada had counted at least 50 of their young men who had been killed in homicides from Toronto to Fort McMurray. They were complaining to the Toronto police that we weren't doing enough about it. This is a local commander, 46 years in the job, as tough a nail cop as you're ever going to find Ron Taverner, having a community meeting with the local Somali community in the heart of one of the most violent prone areas in all of the city, the Dixon Road complex. This was the big takedown that happened in the spring of 2013. This involved the infamous uh, Rob Ford video. For those of you that remember that, this is the gang takedown that involved all that. We had the neighborhood officer team inserted in there six months before. They were already building relationships in advance of this big takedown. Because as you all know, when you do a big takedown, you take, you take criminals out of the community, but you create a vacuum. And in that vacuum, you actually have more disorder. People fight for control, and you actually have more violence. So if you don't have a maintenance strategy built into your takedown, you're actually gonna make the problem worse, not better. And eventually these people get out of jail. And when they come back out, if they come back into the same conditions that they left, they're gonna exploit that to an even greater degree. So the prevention piece, the maintenance piece, the relationship building piece had to happen before, during, and after. So we went in and built a library inside the buildings themselves. Uh, these are the cops, and I wanna just state uh, clearly you can see the black cop and the female cop and the Muslim cop and the Gujarati speaking cop. That's important in a city as diverse as Toronto. 
The sergeant in, in charge of all those cops is a good old white cop, Chris Lausch. And more than any other police officer in Toronto, this guy had built relationships over years with the Somali community. And we brought him to lead this team. Now, yeah, the other guys might be able to actually go into mosque and pray on a Friday. But they had the leadership of a solid veteran cop who understand the value of prevention and community relations. And he wasn't tweeting, but the rest of his team sure as hell could. And so here's one of his officers on a non-issued Toronto police uh, phone with a pink casing around that. I don't know who puts pink casing on their phones, Lori. He's with the kids, talking to them in the physical space, but engaging them with them on the digital platform as well. Okay, all nice hug trees and kumbaya and waste of time stuff, right? Three years before we created this neighborhood officer team, 15 shootings in 2010, 14, 18 in 2012. That was the year we had the Eaton Center shooting and the Danzig shooting. In Danzig, we had 25 people shot, two young people killed. We put the neighborhood officer team in at the end of 2012. The takedown of the uh, gangs was in the spring of 2013. That year, we had five shootings, most of it before the big takedown. The very next year, the full first year, where we had eliminated the gangs and had a full insertion of our neighborhood officers, one shooting. That's hard-ass crime prevention. That is ultimate crime suppression. And that's not just for a week or a month. That's 18 months with the investment of four police officers and a sergeant and two Blackberries and the data package that went with it. So I dismiss any police officer, any police leader, any police chief that tells me that prevention isn't the most important thing that we do and that community relations and neighborhood policing isn't the second most important thing that we do and maybe the most important thing to get the first thing done. I will tell you right now, I had this conversation with Kerry Blakeman. The UK is threatening to reduce, if not eliminate, their neighborhood policing program because of the amount of cuts that are coming to them. And I told this to Kerry and I will tell this to whoever's listening on the live stream, it's the last thing you should cut. It's gold. You put good cops into tough neighborhoods. You leave them there long enough to develop strong relationships. You empower them with the devices that allows them to access the world's knowledge and the global village through the internet. And you will have an immediate and sustained crime reduction that no other amount of enforcement could ever produce. If you need to be more cost effective, reduce crime and increase public trust, do not touch your neighborhood officers. Do not touch your community officers. Do not touch your school resource officers. You leave them in place for as long as you can and you cut everything else around them as far as I'm concerned. Gaming, how many of you guys are gamers? Play a bit of Xbox, hands up, some brave people in here, good for you. I think the last time I did it was called Atari or Pong or something like that. I'm not aware of, maybe it's happening now through FBI or MI6, I'm not aware of any police agency that is actually actively monitoring the activities in gaming environments. You got a bunch of kids playing Xbox, you got all these different games and platforms they can play on. They can do it at physical terminals or they can do it in virtual uh, chat rooms all around the world. So if you're part of Anonymous, so if you're part of ISIS, or you're part of Al-Qaeda, you're part of Hell's Angels, or you're part of any one of the local gangs that you have, if you want to have a, a very deep conversation, planning out your next operation, sharing intelligence information, sharing counter-surveillance information, if you want to negotiate deals between different gangs, you go into an Xbox environment, and you talk as long as you want, and you play some cool games while you're doing it, because the cops aren't there and they ain't listening. They might be monitoring your Twitter feed, they might be checking what you're doing on Facebook, but they're not here. The gaming environment has now dwarfed Hollywood in terms of total value. This is an exponentially growing arena where our young people, you know those young people between 14 and 28 that commit the most crimes, are the most victimized? That's where they are. Are you guys there? Second Life, anybody ever been into Second Life? Only a few brave souls. Second Life is a place where you can go and for a small fee, relatively small fee, you can create a new identity for yourself. For me, I went in there when I didn't get the chief's job in Toronto. I created an identity for myself as a police chief. For 25 bucks, I got a lot of satisfaction out of that wizard. The problem is, the problem is two things. 
you do have to spend money in there to create your identity. And you can be a police chief, or you can be a superhero, you can be a vixen, you can be Brad Pitt, you can be anything you want, but you gotta pay money. I can tell you that this is an industry that is now a billion dollar industry. And there are many different types of Second Life platforms. People actually want to live a fantasy life because their regular life sucks. It's hard. There's kids, there's gas, there's the flu season, there's your lousy boss, there's a community that doesn't appreciate us, but in there, I'm loved. I can be anything I want to be. Second problem there for is you spend a lot of money to create this virtual life, you bankrupt yourself. You invest so much of yourself into the second life that you forget that you actually have a real life. What happens when you're in this second life and you're victimized, you're bullied, you're extorted? Somebody who knows that this is your second life now wants to tell this into the real world and they're extorting money from you. What happens when you're threatened in the second life? And you walk into the local police department and you say, I've been a victim of crime in Second Life. What do you think your front desk officer with 33 years on a job is going to say? But this is happening. More and more we invest in the virtual world. Than outline what happens when the body has been killed not by blunt force or by gunshot because somebody hacked their pacemaker or somebody pressed the insulin pump a few extra times by digitally hacking the system that controls the insulin insulin amounts if you can hack a computer you can hack a computer in a body and if you can hack a computer in a body 
you can hack a computer in a car. And if you can hack a computer in a car, you can hack a plane. And all of these things are technically possible. In fact, cars are being stolen without a human being touching them. You simply need to get into the system and automate it and drive away. Now, the good side of automated cars, self-driving cars, is that it will very well reduce the amount of collisions that we're investigating as police officers. Machines can drive cars more consistently well than human beings can. And they're not subject to the impairments that most people put themselves through from drinking a cup of coffee or snorting a line of coke. And so the future to some degree is brighter, but it's also different and scarier. You can pretty well in the internet of things where machines are connected to machines and machines are connected to people. It's a force of good and it's a force of evil, depending on how you want to work it. This is 2020. I'll be retired in 2018. You're the ones left holding the bag. You're the ones that are going to have to provide effective economical and ethical police services in this world of the Internet of Things. And if that's not scary enough, what we know is the Internet or the web is actually two different places. There's a surface web and then there's a deep dark web. And Flickr and Facebook and Twitter is the top 4% and the rest of the 96% is virtually unexplored places by law enforcement and police agencies. It's very much explored by the Tor network and organized crime. You've got bitcoins, an entire economy going on in there. You've got the Silk Road that sells everything from guns and drugs to babies and organs. The only agency that I know that has completed a success, successful operation in there was the FBI. They took down this network about a year ago. In two weeks, the network was back up and running again because it's not an individual, it's a collective. It's not a place, it's a process. Privacy, human rights was the issue of the 20th century. Privacy will be the issue of the 21st century. If you have not got a privacy lawyer hired by your police department, you're gonna have your asses sued off in short order for everything. If you do not have privacy by design at the very front end of every single thing that you do as a new initiative, whether you're building a real-time crime center or you're gonna have body-worn cameras, you are going to get sued. This is Edward Snowden. Is he a hero or is he a traitor? He had access to government files. He decided that there was a lot of unethical, if not illegal activity. He dumped millions and millions of terabytes of information that compromised security operations for the US around the world. He's now a hunted and wanted man. He'll never be free again, but he believes that his act was not terrorism, was heroism. It's an issue of privacy. It's actually Madison. Life is short, have an affair. There's an issue of privacy here. If you want to have a little thing on the side, should someone be able to hack your account and put it out for public consumption? And if they do put it out for public consumption and you're being extorted as a result of it, should you be able to complain to the local police department? And if you do complain to the local police department, what, if anything, can you or should you do about this particular case? We've got this case because this hacking event took place in Toronto. So you need both a security strategy and the very beginning, a lot of problems at the back end guy with his Google glasses. It's really good. Google bought the largest uh, facial recognition software company in the world. They added that on to their Google platform. The guy wearing those glasses could walk down a line of police officers at a demonstration or anywhere on your streets and using their Google glasses, hands-free, heads up, be able to scan the faces of the police officers. Someone mentioned this before. This means that the world of undercover police operations is officially over. If you're not hiring people right out of some non-law enforcement area, creating a fake, this big guy at the back, wasn't it? you mentioned this, I forget your name. No, plaid shirt right there, no, wasn't you? Okay, you look alike. Well, if you're not hiring people with a clean record from law enforcement and creating a social narrative for them, then when you try to insert them into traditional organized crime or into a jail, they're gonna be compromised, real quick. This is Commissioner Comey of the FBI. His predecessor, Commissioner Mueller, said that cybercrime is the greatest threat to police to uh, North to America, greater than terrorism, and particularly Islamic-related terrorism. His, his, his uh, successor has carried that on. His big problem is that one of the keys to this is public-private partnerships, because there's not enough brain power in the policing world to address this. The problem with our public-private partnerships is before we got into this whole cyber world, Apple and Microsoft and the telcos will provide us the information, access to the IP addresses. They ain't doing it anymore. They got a business to grow and their business can't grow if they keep handing off their clients information to the cops. 
So now they have to get production orders and warrants in order to get access to the information. So Apple goes from the good guy to the pirate all of a sudden. Worse than that, the hardware that exists right now in the majority of our devices, well, it's going to go. And it's going to go into the cloud. And you know the cloud isn't a thing up there. The cloud is a bunch of servers that are placed somewhere else. Well, if the cloud is here in southern Ontario, no problem. We go through the production order in the Canadian-based company. If it's in the States, we've got enough lateral agreements. We can probably get access to it. But if it isn't there, and if it's here in China or Russia or some other place, we ain't going to get to those servers. And so if I'm a smart criminal with anything more than a grade two criminal education, I'm not putting anything on my hardware. It's all going to the cloud, and the servers are guaranteed going to be in some place that the cops in Canada can't get to it. Thank you very much. So ends all your tech crime units. So we got rid of undercover operations, and we got rid of tech crime support. How are we doing so far in the fight against crime in 2020? Then you got the war of attrition. Remember that vertical slope of technology? Every single couple of minutes, somebody invents a new application or a new mobile device, a watch. Anybody who have those new Apple watches? Anyone want to show off your bling? Nobody? Come on. In this room? A Fitbit? Thank you. God, all right. I was losing hope there. A bunch of Luddites in the room. Well, you know, there's stuff that's just multiplying all over the place. So we get drones, and they get 3D guns. And we build a mousetrap, and the mouse figures it out, and then we've got to build a better mousetrap. Remember the problem is that this stuff is happening all the time. We don't get a breather. We have to be continually innovating in an environment that does not allow innovation. In fact, it probably punishes innovation. Tough place to be. Then the laws. So back 100 years ago, when we had horse and buggies all over the place, we didn't need a highway traffic act. Horses didn't move that fast. There weren't a whole bunch of them, and they didn't collide that often. When we motorized these things and put a bunch of metal on them, and they ran into each other, people got killed, and property was damaged and liability increased, so we created a law, the Highway Traffic Act in Ontario, to regulate this. What did we do when we created the information highway? Nothing. We got Bill C-51, and it can't make it out of Senate. I'll tell you what I do, and I go back to this is not a technology lecture, this is a human lecture. I looked around my police service, 5,000 police officers, 2,300 civilians. I looked around for the smartest digital native that I could find. Somebody who is passionate, loyal and committed, articulate, who's really thinking about this all the time, out there talking with the private sector at every single conference like SmileCon, and trying to figure out how to look around corners. I got my guy who can look around corners for me. He can actually shoot around corners. You know, I'm blessed, I've got Ritesh Kotak. He's a parking enforcement officer. He writes parking tags for the first year of his career until he was introduced to me. And for the last three years, he's been working for me directly because I need my Scotty Mills and my Lori McCann and my Ritesh next to me every single day, looking at opportunities and threats, telling me what's coming around the corner, helping me to connect to the private sector, speaking a language that I can't speak and doing things with devices that I can't do. I'm seen as a pretty tech savvy guy. I am not. I can barely turn stuff on and off. But I surround myself with smarter people than me, and I listen to them, and then I act on what I hear. And what I can't do myself, I support them and I let them do, and I shield them. I kick the boulders out of the road. I block a couple of knife strikes coming to the back. I pick them up after they've been kicked around. I dust them off and I get them back in the game again, because that's what I'm supposed to do as a leader. Thank you very much for that. So five years ago, one of the best things I ever did was actually get this social media strategy off the ground. Again, thanks to people like, uh, like um, Scott and, and Lori. But within seconds of it being printed, it was already out of date. And so we've been continually trying to update this strategy ever since then. Chris Boddy, I think, is now one of the, the people that are leading the charge on the latest version of rebooting this thing. Three years ago, uh, Ritesh Kotak live hacked Chief Blair's uh, BlackBerry in the middle of a command meeting. He literally live hacked the Chief's BlackBerry and all of a sudden we got into the first version of Reboot. Uh, three years on, we're still not where we need to be. We've created all sorts of spreadsheets and flowcharts to create a whole new social cyber digital ecosystem within the organization. You heard from Nathan Dyler, he's one of the first members of our new C3 or cyber unit. Uh, we've got members here like Chris who are looking at expanding out these programs. Lori McCann is the one who's gonna be doing our five, uh, heading up the uh, training for our five new layers of training. 
beyond the open source and the initial investigative levels, we need to get right up into deep web investigations. She's going to be working with some of the smartest people, some of whom are in the room, some of them from the private sector in order to get this stuff up and running. We need to have the community involved. The, uh, the green star at the corner there is the external input from community experts like Lori, who are helping us along this journey, because there's no way that we know enough in order to do enough to keep up enough with where things are going. Everything that we do has to have a privacy impact assessment before we even start and all along the way. Every new version of whatever we put out has got to have a privacy stamp on it. We've built a real-time crime center, a real-time resource and risk management center. I personally put that in place a year ago. It is now enabled by the social media digital platforms we talked about. The officers in there and the civilians are tech smart. We recruit them specifically because they've got proven cyber social and digital skills. They're people that are open to change, they're innovative, and they have a deputy chief that shields them from the usual criticisms and gets them the resources that are normally denied to them. They've got their Twitter feed and they've got the ability to, to check networks. For me, what we do in that real-time crime center is not solve crimes, it's prevent crimes in the first instance. It's not run police operations, it's quite frankly running our relationships with the larger community, whether it be the media or young kids out in the, all the different 140 neighborhoods that we have. We're empowered by millennial officers, we're able to engage the various different social networks. And after all that, yes, we can actually do some really good enforcement of the criminal networks as well. We're looking at NextGen 911 as the next big change in police service delivery. And quite frankly, it's not just NextGen 911. With all the different users in Toronto who want to be able to send us a tweet and get a police response, it's not just for emergencies. Yeah, they want to be able to say, help, I'm trapped in, a, in an elevator, or help, I think I've been the victim of a sexual assault. But they also want to be able to text us and put a Facebook post up that, hey, we don't see the cops around anymore. When are we gonna see the neighborhood cop walk through here? And so it's not just next gen 911, it's next gen 311. It's next gen everything. Any member of the public on any device that they choose to use on any digital platform should be able to send a message to us that we can receive to some degree analyze and respond to in some way. Whether that's a physical set of officers showing up or it's a referral to a community agency we should be able to do that on any platform, any time of day, anywhere in the world, because the technology is not the problem. If you've got an app for your police service, like Victoria PD or Ottawa PD or now Toronto Police Service, then you are already doing Next Gen 911. And you've built a platform on which the rest of the bells and whistles can be, can be attached to. I'm gonna just skip through this real quick. This is predictive analysis. You cannot do predictive analysis by just using crime data. You cannot do it unless you're using social media sentiment. That means you're listening and scraping social media postings from Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, and you're matching that up against the real crime historical data that you have, and you're seeing what's taking place in terms of crime and what's taking place in people's conversations around crime that have been committed and crimes that might be committed in the future. And I say crimes. It could be public disorder, demonstration, local gang war that's kind of heating up. Once you've got that social media sentiment, you also have to recognize that most people in the world don't speak English. And even in an English speaking country like Canada, there's 200 different languages and dialects. And so you need to have international translation services and there's software and applications that can provide that for you as well too. This is not a lecture about technology, it's a lecture about people. This is a brand new shiny recruit from a recruit class about two years ago. Crosses the floor at his graduation day, gets his badge from chief of police, salutes smartly, off he goes, 24 hours later, he's in a police station. He's being paraded by his new sergeant and assigned to his coach officer. And what happens to this educated, articulate, speaks multiple languages, worked as a manager in a tech company for five years before he joined the job. As soon as he gets into the police car on his first shift, what happens to that poor recruit? You're not driving, don't touch the radio, don't ask any stupid questions, don't offer an opinion. Three years later, we might actually talk to you like a human being. We degrade the human capital of $100,000 worth of police officer down to about 50% in the first 24 hours. And that officer will never be able to actually be innovative and a leader and have their own opinion, probably till they get around 20 years in the job and a little bit of rank on their shoulders. What a pathetic waste of the most important resource that we have. And for us, 2,000 officers that we hired over the last 10 years, 1,800 of which are millennials, they will hardly ever get to touch a device for an official police responsibility. What a waste of talent at a time that we need that talent so desperately. So you need an HR strategy as much as you need an IT strategy. If you're not recruiting in millennial talent, if you are not promoting and deploying, equipping and training and certifying, rewarding, disciplining where necessary, 
people in this social cyber digital space, you will not be able to compete no matter how much hardware and software you throw at folks. You need an HR strategy in order to make your IT strategy work. And don't forget in all this, it's not a matter of what you can do because with technology, you can do virtually anything. With technology, there's nothing you can't do. There's no place you can't go. There's nothing you can't bring down or blow up or hack. So as a police officer or a member of Anonymous or a member of ISIS, technology means we can do anything, but that doesn't mean that we should do anything. So you gotta figure out what the ethical framework is. And right now, nobody's got that figured out. I don't have it figured out. It's not just privacy, it's ethics. What's the right way for us to go about doing this business in the new world order? I finish off here and I apologize. I might've crept over time. Yes, I have, I apologize. Uh, I think uh, Dixon of Doc Green, have I got that right, Terry? An actual real police officer, they made a, a TV show, one of the most popular TV shows back in the 50s and 60s. This is your traditional walk the beat cop. This was the epitome of nine principles of Peel, right? We need a lot more of this, not less of this. We got the Adam 12, put the, car, the cops in the cars, race to minutes or less was a standard we moved ourselves. So get me wrong, there's always gonna be a portion of that. What is the future of policing? This slide up again, three years ago. Three years ago, this was sexy. The future of policing is a cop holding a Blackberry. How sexy is that? And now we got cops with iPhone, with, with Google Glasses and NYPD and Abu Dhabi police. We've got cops with mobile cameras affixed to their glasses, collecting information in every single engagement. This is the former chief of Salt Lake City, one of the smartest police leaders ever that I've ever come across. Kind of looks like Carrie Blakeman too. Okay, you didn't get the joke? Sorry about that, Carrie. And this is a picture of a UK cop. He's got Kevlar vest for him, keep them hungry, monitoring of their systems for heart rate, blood pressure. Last message, folks. This was uh, this is what our business has been for the last 50 years in modern policing enforcement. Law enforcement is not our business. It is a thin slice of our business. We're always going to have to arrest the bad guys. Some really bad people who have guns that need to go to jail. Nothing in my presentation should make you think I'm soft on crime, but we need to do a whole lot more of this. For every one arrest, we need to have a hundred good news stories. And it can't just be good news stories of cops reaching out to kids in communities at, at high risk. It has to be stories that you're willing and able to capture on the digital platforms that we've talked about. If you can't capture this picture of a pay duty cop in 52 division bending down to tie the shoelaces of an elderly gentleman who's about to trip and fall, then nobody else is gonna know about it. If you can't get this story from 23 division about a group of cops in a tough area of the city who are criticized continuously of racial profiling who went and got this bike for this kid who was victimized, then everyone's just gonna keep accusing the cops in 23 Division of being heartless, soulless, jackboot Nazis. This is the uh, funeral for Ryan Russell, a sergeant that was killed in the line of duty about three years ago. Many of your agencies were represented, maybe some of you were there with us, and thank you very much for your support. The Sea of Blue, nameless, faceless people in the crowd. I like this picture. This is a cop. This is one of those 2000 officers that we hired. It's one of those 1800 millennials. Now, when I first saw this picture, I actually didn't like it. I said, look at the disrespectful nature of this picture. Who is this snot nosed rookie cop who in the middle of one of the most solemn occasions is snapping a selfie. And then someone who was a little younger than me pointed out, but boss, that's just the way we are. That's not disrespect. It's how we share and care. So don't look at that through your old fashioned lens. Look at that through the new lens. And you know what that officer's going to do with that selfie? He's going to put it out to his followers. And they're going to comment on this funeral. And it's probably going to be mostly positive. So before you pick up the phone and find out who is that dumbass cop and criticize him, why don't you consider picking up the phone and going, hey, did you actually get that picture? Did you share it out? And if you haven't, could you put it out and tag me in it? And I'll retweet it for you. I'll tell you what, if you take that sea of blue and you put into those hands one of these, and you put behind them the wind and the sails that a deputy chief or an inspector or a staff sergeant or a sergeant can do, and you empower them with their own Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts, you get us back into the game that right now I think we're out of. 
you give us a fighting chance to stay up with that wave of technology and change that's affecting us. You give us the ability to rebuild the trust that we've so badly lost over the last decade of enforcement-driven policing. You allow us to prevent crimes in huge numbers rather than responding to a wave of crime that's waiting to hit us. If you do that, you allow our police officers, our frontline cops, our men and women in all those neighborhoods across all the jurisdictions to win back hearts and minds that we have lost. You give them a chance to re-engage the eyes and the ears of the community to get the intelligence information to prevent that kid from being radicalized and prevent that crime from happening. And you get people's hands. Physically, they'll get back into the neighborhoods. They'll shake your hands and look you in the eye and they say, I've got your back. And if you get your ass kicked in the middle of some place in 31 Division, you might be able to look over your shoulder and not see a bunch of cops coming to help you, but a bunch of the community coming to help you. That's what we need to do. For me, that's now. That's not five years from now in 2020. That's right now. But if we don't start doing it right now, 2020 is going to look a lot more depressing, a lot more threatening, a lot more unsustainable financially, operationally, than it is right now. I will tell you with great humility, I have failed you folks. In 27 years, I thought I could create something better for you and leave something better for you. I have not been able to do it, despite my best efforts. I stood in front of a group of Ontario's next generation police chiefs at Rotman U of T on a police executive development program. And I said the same thing to you. My generation of police leaders have failed you. We have not adequately prepared you for what the future holds. What I'm saying to you is I hope you take something away from this last, unfortunately, hour and 15 minutes. Take something away. Don't be afraid to go back to your organization. Despite the negativism and the cynicism that you're going to face, do something with it. Get us back on track. Put us back onto those winning ways that we, we've, we've enjoyed in the past. Otherwise, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. I want to thank you again, Lori, for putting us on, bringing this to Canada, to Niagara Falls. I want to thank all of you for coming and participating. I want to thank whoever let you come here and paid your bill and allowed you to be away from the office. I want to thank those of you that are brave enough and courageous enough, courageous enough to go back and do something with what, not just what you heard from me, but from every, every other speaker. This is a tough business. It has always been. But I also know the quality of the people that I've worked with for 27 years, the people I've met in international trips, from Kosovo to the UK to the Caribbean. I know that cops are good people. We do good things, but we need to be better. And we need to do better things. We need to do it in a hurry. So thank you and God bless. Are there questions? <laughs> I just... you the most okay the social media project that we're running right now that excites me the most i referenced it really quickly it's a tps mobile app again full credit to ritesh kotak he was the architect behind this uh, we got government grant money for less than seventy thousand dollars and some private uh, pr private um, public partnerships we we're able to put together a, a, an app for the toronto police service it's in version 1.2 i think right now we're heading to 1.3 the reason why i'm most excited about this is not the creation of yet another app in the universe of apps but for me, it represents the first big step towards the next gen 911, where members of the community can reach us on text, on email, Facebook posts, Twitter posts, and receive not just a 911 response, but potentially any other type of police service response. And it's also an ability for us to engage our internal members and raise the level of morale within the Toronto Police Service. That's just one of the many programs that I'm involved with, but one that I think has the biggest potential for the future. I love the idea of having officers have their phones and being able to document and say where we are and here we're grabbing a cup of coffee, come join us. But what if, how do you feel about the social climate and everyone knowing where your officers are and the potential for a, a threat against them or violence against them? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, so let me give you the negative side first. Um, we have had in the last year attacks on our officers that literally by a millimeter would have killed one of them. There was an officer in 31 division who was behind the front desk, a person with a serious hate on for police and a history of mental issues, um, came through the front doors of 31 division, 
with a large size hammer and got within literally a millimeter of taking the cranium right out of this police officer. It was all around the hype of racial profiling and the hype of ISIS and Islamic threat. It's a hostile environment in Toronto, and we can see that happening right around North America and probably through a lot of the Western world. There's no doubt there's a heightened threat. But I can also tell you that just because you tweet that you're going to be at Tim Hortons is not going to put you at any more risk. The fact is that every cop shows up at the same place every day to go to work. And they leave from the same place every day. Most of us leave from a place when we're unarmed. And most of us don't live in walled communities and have a gun tucked under our bed. Our American counterparts might be a little bit different. But the reality is, if you really want to hurt a cop, you don't have to follow their Twitter feed. We have not had an officer attack because they've put out their Twitter feed, and we've had over 300 officers tweeting almost every single day everything they do, and a lot of them do it even on their own private time. And so the reality does not meet the fear. Could it be possible that by doing that, somebody knows where you're going to be? Sure, it's possible. But we advertise all sorts of events, bike rodeos, community meetings, town hall meetings, and we show up there regularly. We allow ourselves to mingle in with the crowd. We're not sitting there in a state of hypervigilance. And so social media is not going to make that worse. In fact, if you do the social part of social media, you'll actually create more trust and legitimacy, which will actually make you more safe in your neighborhoods. Um, a lot of the um, anti-police rhetoric you see in social media is often based, uh, not in fact. Um, there's a lot of outright lies there. Um, can you comment on sort of optics versus reality and how we counter that, that narrative? Yeah. Um, I was talking with uh, Craig. Craig Smith was, is the manager in charge of our video services unit, one of those brilliant civilian minds who really, through his innovation, his tech-savvy approach, uh, advanced the Toronto Police Service significantly. And Martin, who asked the question, is one of his major lieutenants. So full credit to both of you. Uh, I worked for Julian Fantino. I was in charge of corporate communications as a staff inspector back in 2002 when I came back from a UN peacekeeping mission. Julian Fantino, if you remember, was a larger-than-life police chief, and he loved media. He didn't love what he was getting from his corporate communications, so he asked me to go in there. I was doing my MBA at the time, and he said, can you redesign my corporate communications? I need it to be bigger, more effective, more tech-savvy. I want you to be able to use the new technology to be able to amplify my voice and our service into the community. And so I spent about six months researching and designing it and put together a plan. The restructuring of the corporate communications unit that exists now is entirely based off of that plan done 10 years ago, with the exception of one thing. We did not create a 24-7 news shop, which is what I wanted to do. And I was going to merge the video services unit with the corporate communications unit. I was going to put them onto the internet. I didn't know what social media was back then, but I was going to put them into the internet so we could live stream that information. I didn't have that tech terminology, but we could put it out on a 24-hour basis. So we could tell our story. So we could be the sole source of truth that we could compete with all those other narratives from Hollywood making people believe that we can solve a case in 45 minutes and two commercial breaks using laser beams and then screwing up our cops and they go to give evidence in a court of law that they didn't have somehow have the laser beam attached to them. So we could do the counter narrative to the activists who are out there putting misinformation, if not outright lies. We never did do that. I think we're actually going to do that next year, 2016, only 14 years later. See what I mean about the time creep problem? Listen, with digital platforms, a police chief in a police department of two people could create a 24-hour news cycle, could put out from the public complimenting their officers anywhere in North America and have that information go anywhere in the world and anywhere in the universe. There's no excuse in the technology not to be able to fill the social media highways and the mainstream media highways and the conversation highways with our truth, with irrefutable fact. The only thing stopping us from doing that is us and our stupid conservative culture. I hope that answers your question, Martin. All right, people need to catch a plane, I think, Lori. Or there's a bear waiting for them in the Blue Jays game. Anybody know the score in the Blue Jays game? Oh, thank God. Okay, good. I'll get off the stage. I just want to really quickly, I haven't thanked Niagara Regional Police, I think, once all of this conference, and I'm remiss in doing that. So thank you so much. Phil, great job. Thank you. Thank you, Niagara. And
huge thanks to my group here, a bunch of lunatics they are. Uh, they're a lot of fun and they, do, they work really, really hard. And other than that, I now pronounce you smiles.